All right, let's get into the Word. Can't wait. Great study. Leviticus chapter 23. We're not going to complete the chapter tonight. Uh, we're only, uh, Lord willing, going to make it from verse 1 to verse 14, and I think you'll see why as we get uh, into the study. Uh, so once you uh, find your way there, we can uh, begin with prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time uh, in this amazing uh, chapter in the book of Leviticus. So if you would join with me. Father, again, we would ask you to settle our hearts and focus our attention upon you and not on the cares and the affairs and the distractions of the day, of the week, and the busyness of our lives. Lord, we really need for you, by your Holy Spirit, to not only grab our attention, but hold our attention so that we don't miss anything that's woven into the fabric of the text that we have before us tonight. Lord, we want to hear you speak in that still, small voice as you minister to us, as you teach us, and as you speak to us. So, Lord, we would simply say, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, well, I know this is going to sound really sensational, but we're about to embark on what could be deemed one of the most fascinating studies in the entire Bible. Now, I know that sounds like a pretty, you know, <laughs> again, sensational statement, but here in chapter 23, we have the seven annual feasts which the Lord appoints for the children of Israel to celebrate as holy days, or if you prefer, holidays, which is actually what holy days are. Holy days, holidays, holidays. I remember one time, just even recently on the way to church, my boys asked me if Halloween was considered a holiday. I said, absolutely not. There is absolutely nothing holy about Halloween. It is a satanic celebration, a demonic celebration, and it is not a holiday. And I said it just like that too, and they never asked me a question about it again. <laughs> now the reason I am so passionate about this is because in the United States of America, we have the lamest holidays. I mean, aside from Easter and Christmas, I mean, we really think about it. What is this April Fool's Day? What a foolish holiday. And here in Hawaii, we find every reason to, to have a holiday. It's Tuesday. Let's have a holiday. No school. Close down every government program. No rubbish. Tuesday's a holiday. Why? It's partly cloudy Tuesday. Didn't you hear? I know I'm being silly, but for a reason. Here's why. The feasts were holidays. They were holy days, and they were rich with meaning. And I want to take some time in this study, because what makes this study so exciting is that these feasts are prophetic in how they speak to and point to the person of Jesus Christ. Can I say it this way? It's all about Jesus. Jesus can be found in every verse, in every chapter, in every book in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, starting in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning. And God says, let us, plural, create man in our plural image. He's talking about Jesus, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there is our first introduction to the person of Jesus Christ. And this is what now God is going to do here. He is going to introduce the Israelites to their Messiah, pre-Bethlehem, before he is even born. And he's going to now present 
the Savior of all mankind, the Jewish Messiah, and he's going to now institute these feasts. And in these feasts, and, and in every detail in these feasts, there will be a prophetic, what I like to call, scripture picture of the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 1, let's jump in. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it, it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Okay, now here's the introduction of sorts. As the Lord tells Moses to speak to the children of Israel about what he calls the feasts of the Lord. Now, while not a feast, he begins with the Sabbath. Why? Because these holy days were to be set apart from the other days like the Sabbath day. They were to be made holy, a.k.a. holy days or holidays. In other words, these were days that were to be set apart as a time of celebration and commemoration as a proclamation. And I know they all end the nation. But it was a proclamation of all God had done and even more importantly, all that God would yet future do, as we're going to see. Now, I think it would be remiss to not have an understanding of what the feast really was. And I think that this in our culture can be easily missed because you have to understand in the Middle Eastern culture, uh, as an Arab in my culture, uh, everything's centered around feasting. And, and by the way, there's going to be f food in heaven. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait. No calories, no cholesterol, no nothing, man. No fat. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's all healthy. And <laughs> so, uh, hey, think about this. What's good? What about the wedding feast, the wedding supper of the Lamb? I can't wait. I mean, it's, it's going to be great. I just, I'm already drooling and salivating thinking of it. Now, what was a feast? Okay. Feasts were festive festivals. Feast, feastive, festive, festival. This was a celebration. And it was a commemoration. Now, in the original language of the Old Testament Hebrew, it's, uh, it's the word that means appointed time or points to a time or, if you will, a an appointment. Now, this is one of those words in the Hebrew that's the same as the word in my original uh, tongue of Arabic. It's the word mo'ad. Now, if I were to say to you in Arabic that I'm going to make an appointment with you, this is how I would say it. Ana lazim namal mo'ad ma'ak. If you're a male, if you're a female, ma'aki. Uh, I didn't just swear at you or call you a name. That's what, how you would say that in Arabic. Uh, moad. I'm going to make a moad maaki or makum or with you. Okay? Now, what is God saying here? I'm going to make an appointment with you. That's what these feasts would point to is that appointment with you. He has an appointment with them. The, the Savior, the Messiah, has an appointment with them. So, if, uh, in other words, it's a fixed time or a season or specifically a festival that pointed to a specific time, an appointed time, an appointment in time. Now, these seven feasts were given to Israel to celebrate over a seven-month period of time. Interesting, of course, we know of seven. It's the number of 
completion. And what we're going to see in these seven feasts is a complete picture that marries Bible history with Bible prophecy in all of its completeness. Uh, we find this seven month period of time beginning in the spring and continuing through to the fall. We see the feasts in the Pentateuch or the first five books of Moses uh, starting in Exodus chapter 12 verses, uh, well actually the whole chapter, uh, chapter 23 verses 14 through 17. Uh, all seven feasts are here in Leviticus chapter 23. We'll see it again in Numbers 28 and 29 when we get there in a couple of years. And then <laughs> we'll see it again in Deuteronomy 16 when we get there, Lord willing, before the rapture. Now, these seven feasts over seven months were for them then, but have either already been fulfilled or will soon be fulfilled by Jesus for us now. Consider what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossian church. It's found in Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 through 17. Now, Lord willing, uh, hopefully this will connect the dots and even fill in some of the blanks as to what these feasts met, meant for them then and what they mean for us now. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or if you prefer a feast or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which are a, watch this, mere shadow of what is to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Interesting, the King James will translate Moad or uh, festival or feast uh, as a sign as well. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that these festivals were mere shadows. The shadow was the shadow of the substance and the substance was Jesus Christ himself. In other words, don't let anyone judge you with regards to these Sabbath uh, days or these new moon festivals or these seven feasts because the person of Jesus Christ fulfilled them. They have served their purpose. This is how you could answer the question of why don't we celebrate these feasts today? They've served their purpose. How so? Jesus has already come. In other words, these were merely shadows that pointed to the person, the substance that created the shadow. These were signs that pointed to the person of Jesus Christ and his first and of course subsequently his second coming, which we'll talk about more in a moment. And we've talked about this before. And so you'll bear with me as I just, again, kind of bring it together because you have to understand that the Sabbath was a sign. It was a sign that pointed them to the destination, their final destination. Once they had arrived at their destination, namely the first coming of Jesus Christ, that sign had served its purpose. It was no longer needed. Again, it's like that sign you see in town that says Kaneohe, you know, 14 miles. And so in, when you're still in Honolulu, that sign, you need that sign. It serves a purpose, that sign, because it's pointing you to your final destination. So now once I get to Kaneohe, I've arrived. I don't need the sign anymore. I'm here. Jesus came here. We don't need the signs anymore. He fulfilled the Sabbath. That's why we don't need the Sabbath anymore. See? That's why we don't need these feasts anymore. They've served their purpose. And they were mere shadows of what was to come. What was to come? Jesus Christ. Well, he's already come. He came here, his first destination. So that's what these feasts were all about. They were just mere shadows of things to come. The substance of them being found in Jesus Christ. These feasts were prophetic types or symbols that pointed to Jesus Christ and which would be fulfilled in him. Now here's what's interesting. We won't get to the last uh, four. We want to get to the uh, first three. But the first three feasts... Uh, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits would take place in the spring over a period of eight days. The fourth feast, the Feast of 
the harvest, also known by its Greek name, the Feast of Pentecost. Now understand, pent means five. You got a pentagram, the pentagon, the uh, pentateuch, the, you know, uh, pent means five. So Pentecost was a word meaning 50. And so this fourth feast, the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Harvest, was 50 days later at the beginning of the summer. Now the last three feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles took place over a period of 21 days in the fall of the year. So again, seven feasts, seven months, a complete picture of the completed work of Jesus Christ as the Savior of mankind. Verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So we start off with the first one, and it's the Feast of Passover, the Passover celebration. And we're told that it's to be on the 14th day of the first month. In fact, it would begin a new calendar. Uh, the Feast of Passover is a prophetic picture of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. The Apostle Paul, this time to the Corinthian church in his first letter, chapter 5, second part of verse 7 says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. All through the scriptures you have lambs being sacrificed and without exception they point to the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed for the sins of mankind. First you had Abel. He offered a lamb for a man, Genesis 4. Then you had Israel offered a lamb for a family, Exodus 12. The priests offered a lamb for a nation, Exodus 29. And then ultimately and finally, Jesus offered himself as the lamb for the world, John 1, which is what all of these lambs that were to be sacrificed would, of course, point to. Now, in the Passover celebration, the Israelites were given some astonishing details. Uh, the book of Exodus provides us with the details. I mean, it had to be down to the gnat's eyebrow. <laughs> yes, gnats have eyebrows. That's how detailed it had to be in order to sacrifice exactly at the exact time and the exact way this Passover lamb. Why? Because if you didn't, you would ruin the typology. So at first, the details seem maybe a little bit graphic, but it's important to know that there's a reason for all the extreme attention to the detail. We're going to see that in a moment. But obviously, the Passover lamb points to Jesus, who will ultimately fulfill all of the details that were given to the Israelites. Now we see the, the details given to us in the 12th chapter of Exodus. You're certainly welcome to turn there if you'd like. I'll just read it real quick, verses 1 through 16, because I don't want us to miss what's here, and that's why we're taking the necessary time to do this. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. This is now the Exodus, and the angel of death is going to pass over uh, the Israelites if and only if the blood of the innocent lamb that was slain and the blood that was shed was on the doorposts of their house. Then they would be saved, only if the blood was there. And the blood had to come from that Passover lamb. Now listen to the details. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month of the, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one of their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of the lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. They couldn't be, they couldn't have a blemish or a defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the, watch this, 14th day of the month. 
In other words, there's going to be a four-day window from the 10th day to the 14th day before this lamb is sacrificed. So, until the 14th day of the month when all of the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Interesting detail again. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. Again, fascinating detail. Uh, verse 8, that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Again, a detail. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Graphic detail. Do not leave any of it till morning. There's a reason for that. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. And there's a reason for that. Verse 11, this is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance for seven days. You are to eat bread made without yeast. And we'll get into the Feast of Unleavened Bread momentarily. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly. Uh, and another one on the seventh day, do no work at all on these days, again the Sabbath, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Okay, did you get all that? Did you get all the instructions? You're going to be tested on this next Thursday. You know, seriously, you are. You think I'm kidding? I am. <laughs> but here's the thing. Could you imagine the Israelites? Okay, Moses. Moses is commanded to speak to the Israelites. Okay, here's what we got to do. Here's what we got to do. You want to be saved? We got to get a lamb. <laughs> T tenth day, four days, we got to inspect the lamb, make sure it's without blemish. Fourteenth day, we got to slay the lamb, and then we got to take the blood, and here's what we got to do. And you guys getting all this? And could you picture the Israelites? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, Moses, slow down. <laughs> Did you say bitter herbs? Okay, bitter herbs. Wait. <laughs> Honey, we need bitter herbs. Can you need bitter herbs? Why all the detail? Why do we need to know all of this? What's the purpose in this? Because every detail would speak to every detail in the crucifixion of the Christ. Here's a few, not exhaustive. Perhaps you've heard them before. First of all, with the Passover, the calendar starts over with the Passover lamb. So too with Jesus, the calendar started over as the lamb. Uh, with the Passover, the lamb is brought in the house on the 10th day. Jesus, and we'll see this uh, in a moment, Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem as prophesied on the 10th day. Uh, the Passover lamb was to be inspected for four days to be found without blemish before it was to be slain. Jesus was tried on trial. No sin was found. Nothing, there was no fault, no blemish. And he was tried there in Jerusalem prior to his crucifixion for how many days? Four days. With the Passover lamb, the lamb was to be found without any blemish, just as Jesus was found to be innocent without any sin. With the Passover, the blood of the lamb was placed on the doorposts in the shape of a cross. See, I always used to think that it was the four corners of the door. No. They were to take that hyssop branch, they were to dip it into the blood of this slain lamb, and they were to place it on the top of the doorpost. There was a basin down below and on each side of the doorpost. And if you take that, how that blood was arranged, what a coincidence, huh? What, that it's in the shape of a cross? How, did, I, how cool is that? The blood was in the shape. God is introducing the Israelites to the cross long before, generations before, the Romans would even come up with this cruel form of capital punishment. 
called crucifixion. This was all a foreshadow of the substance found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Passover lamb had to come into contact with fire. Fire in typology in the scripture is always a picture of judgment. Just as Jesus had to endure the judgment taking upon himself the sin of all mankind. Now, I want to get into the timeline here because when you look at the triumphal entry, okay, and you take it to the exact hour at twilight when Jesus Christ uh, died, you'll find that to be precisely in accordance with the detail that was given to the Israelites with the Passover lamb. The tenth of Aviv, for the tenth day, the procession of the lamb would be brought into the temple, just as Jesus' procession into Jerusalem took place on that exact day, Matthew 21, 17. Also on that day began the examination of the lamb. Again, the Israelites were to examine the lamb for four days. They would sort of put the lamb on trial, if you will, Exodus 12, 1 through 11, just as Jesus Jesus was questioned, Jesus was on trial, and his trial lasted four days, Matthew 22, 15 through 33. Now, four days later, after he's been found, <laughs> nothing, nothing has been found, and the hands have been washed because they have found no, no crime with this man. The 14th of Aviv, Passover begins at 6 o'clock p.m. Do you realize that is when exactly Jesus began his path to the cross? The third hour, the lambs are prepared for the sacrifice at 9 a.m. That's when Jesus was beaten in his preparation for the cross, Matthew 27, 28. The ninth hour, lambs are sacrificed. This is 3 o'clock p.m., and that is the exact precise time in the detail that Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, Matthew 27, 48 through 52. And there you have the Passover lamb, the prophetic fulfillment fulfilled in the crucifixion of the Christ. Well, there's more. The Passover lamb was to be eaten with bitter herbs, well, Jesus endured the bitterness of the cross and was even offered uh, a uh, sort of a painkiller with that hyssop branch, just as the Israelites were to take the hyssop branch to apply the blood. The Passover lamb had to be finished by the morning. Why? Because on resurrection morning, Jesus would say, uh, for, for resurrection morning, Jesus would say, it is finished. There's nothing left and there cannot be anything left. Why? Because it must be finished. Why does it need to be finished? Because it is finished. There's nothing more. There's nothing left. And that's why nothing could be left until morning. Uh, the Passover lamb would save them from the death to the firstborn. Jesus saves those who are born again in the second birth. I know that's kind of a gnarly way of saying it, but I think you understand uh, what it is that I'm trying to say here. Is, don't you find it as a, as a, a coincidence? <laughs> Not. That this would be a sparing, a saving of the firstborn. By who? The firstborn of God. The only begotten Son of God. Uh, there's, there's so many parallels here, and time doesn't permit, but be that as it may, the Passover lamb was not to have any bones broken. Do you realize that there was a prophecy that none of his bones would be broken? Well, what, wait a minute. What about when we celebrate the Passover with the communion table? We say, this is my body. You know, when we partake of the bread, this is my body broken for you. Okay, listen. It wasn't his bones that were broken. It was his body, his skin that was broken, that was pierced, that was bludgeoned, that the blood would be shed. Not one bone was broken. No bone on this Passover lamb could be broken because, again, it would ruin the typology. Now, we'll talk about this in the next feast, but the bread had to be without leaven. Why? Because leaven in the scriptures is a picture of sin. And we'll see that again here uh, momentarily. Verse uh, 6. 
On the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. Now this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What is the prophetic picture in the Feast of Unleavened Bread? The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a prophetic picture of Christ's burial. The Passover, a prophetic picture of Christ's crucifixion. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, a prophetic picture of Christ's burial. Now there's an interesting uh, tradition amongst the Jews practiced till this day uh, at the Passover meal in how they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let me just share with you uh, these parallels and this prophetic picture. At the Passover meal, they have three pieces of unleavened bread for the Feast of Unleavened Bread to take place on the 15th day. The three breads represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, the triune nature of God. Now, this matzah bread, as it's called, in the center, the second one, is then broken into two, two pieces. The second matzah represents Jesus' body that was broken, not his bones, his body. The matzah bread now is two pieces of one bread. Jesus was two. He was both fully God and fully man, and still is. I think it jams a lot of our Christian gears, because we've tidied up the cross. We've tidied up the crucifixion. I mean no disrespect when I say this, but, you know, when we hang our necklaces with the cross on it, I mean, if you really want to know the truth and be true to what the cross represented, go get a, a necklace of an electric chair. How crude is that? Because that's what it represented. It was capital punishment. It was a form of putting to death an individual. And that's what the cross represented. Now, why do I say that? Well, I say that because we're told in the scriptures that when we behold Satan, we're just going to be blown away at how beautiful he is. He's going to be astonishingly beautiful, breathtaking. We're going to be taken back and oh my, this is the one who deceived the nations? I, I don't appreciate how Satan is depicted in our culture today. He's depicted as a cartoon character with these red tights and this pitchfork. And he's as if to not be real. No, he's very real. You know, when I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in January of 1982, I first came to the reality that Satan was real before I came to the realization that Jesus was real. See, Satan was real in my life. And he was destroying my life. He was roaring around, uh, roaming like a, a lion, seeking to devour me. And he was succeeding quite smashingly well, I might add, when Jesus saved me. But I knew Satan was real. He's not a red pitchfork cartoon character. And, and even these depictions of him as being this, you know, evil looking horns and no way. Satan never appears to you and says to you, hi, <laughs> I'm the devil and I'm here to destroy your life. <laughs> that was pretty bad, I know. But You'll never forget it. <laughs> You'll always remember that dorky illustration of when I tried to impersonate Satan. No, he appears as an angel of light. He appears as an angel of light. And you'll think it's right. Satan is going to be beautiful. He was a beautiful creation. He was a very intelligent creation. And we're going to behold him and we're just going to be blown away by him. And we're going to say of him, that's him? Now conversely, when we behold the lamb that was slain, we're going to see him as a lamb that was slain. And it's going to be brutal. And we're going to be aghast. 
at the horror of what he endured for us. And just as we're going to be mesmerized by Lucifer, Satan, the devil, we're going to be repulsed by the lamb who was slain. I, that's too high for my understanding. I, in my finite mind, I cannot get my mind around that. I'm trusting that on that great and final day when I see my Jesus and I behold him and I see him face to face, I'm going to be able to handle it. And I'm just going to fall down and worship him. I won't be able to do anything else. I'm just going to worship him. You know, I was, when Leitu said, hey, say to your neighbor, glory in the highest. You know, the thought came to my mind. I, I can't wait to say to him, face to face before the throne, on my face before him, glory. Glory in the highest. I'm going to behold him as the lamb that was slain. <sighs> so now you've got two pieces of one bread representing the dual nature of Christ, fully God, fully man. Now the larger of the two pieces is called the afikamen. And the afikamen in the Greek language is a word that some believe means I came or I have come. Now this is again how they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread today. The afikamen is wrapped in a cloth and hidden. Just as Jesus was wrapped in a burial cloth and hidden in the tomb. Now these young Jewish children would run and race to find the hidden Afi common, and if they found it, they would receive a prize. Do you see where, that, where that's going? So we come to Jesus as a child, run the race, and receive the prize. There's more, <laughs> but I think that says a lot. The Apostle Paul in his first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, said, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. <laughs> this is a good verse for your refrigerator if you want. That ye may be a new lump. I don't know if there's any worship songs that, you know, title. Let's sing. Let's all rise and sing hymn number 562 that ye may be a new lump. <laughs> hey, we might be on to something here. Anyway, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Do you realize that every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are celebrating the Passover meal. We are celebrating, when we pass out, oh, by the way, <laughs> I guess we can't say that anymore. When we, when we give you those cardboard wafers, <laughs> that are, I don't know if they're really food or not, but that's okay. <laughs> and that is a symbol of unleavened bread. And that is a celebration of this feast. Christ's burial, Christ's body broken for us. Verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come in the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. I love this. Again, here's the detail. Okay, this is the feast of first fruits, which we'll talk about in more detail in a moment. But you know when the, the priests would do the wave offering? This is the first mention of the wave. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> the wave was up, down, left, right, north, south, east, west, in the shape of a cross. That's how they were to bring this grain offering, this, the first fruits of their uh, income 
and that which had come out of the ground. Put that in your hip pocket because that's what this feast speaks to in its prophetic picture. So the priest shall wave it. And verse 12, you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine, one fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay, so the Feast of First Fruits is the third of the seven feasts, and it's a prophetic picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ coming up out of the ground. As the Israelites were to bring what would come up out of the ground, the first fruits, as an offering, and the priest was to offer it as a wave offering in the shape of a cross, and a prophetic, a perfect and complete prophetic picture in just these first three of the seven feasts. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. The uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what everything pointed to. Again, the Apostle Paul alludes to this. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 through 24. He says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now, this is not a soul sleep. This is a bodily sleep. When we talk about the first resurrection, it's not our souls that are resurrected. It's our bodies that are re resurrected. This is a bodily resurrection. So, those who are asleep, for since by a man, speaking of Adam, came death, by a man, speaking of Jesus, the second and final Adam, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Okay. You've heard it said, a picture is worth a thousand words. You know what I love about God's Word? <laughs> There's a lot of pictures. I'm a visual learner. I, you probably noticed that by now for if you've been coming for any length of period of time. I just, you know, for me, I, I need to see column A, column B, column C. Okay, here's the reference, here's the feast, here's the fulfillment. Okay, that just, somehow that just connects it for me. And I need to see, you know, a picture, a, a graphic and visual image. You know, my wife always gives me a hard time. She says, you know, what would you do if you didn't have PowerPoint? I said, what are you talking about? She says, well, you know, honey, the Apostle Paul never had PowerPoint. Yet he, pre Jesus never had, he didn't have PowerPoint. What would you do? You could, I, I, could you even preach a sermon without using your visual, you know, PowerPoint, uh, you know, slides? You know, being the godly husband that I am, who never gets defensive, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but then I thought, I said, wait a minute. Jesus did use visual il illustrations. The Apostle Paul did use visual illustrations. You know my favorite visual? I mean, in other words, if Jesus had PowerPoint, he'd have used it. He didn't there on the mount as he's <laughs> preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And he uses the visual picture of the birds. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. He's using visual. See, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's what these feasts were. I mean, when you see the picture prophetically painted on the canvas of God's Word, it just makes it all real. It's not just words on the page in your Bible. It makes it real because you're now able to get your mind around what's really happening here. And so this was a picture. These visual pictures were given as signs pointing to the final destination. See, it didn't just end with Jesus' first coming. Once Jesus arrived the first time to his first destination here on earth, the, again, again, the sign wasn't needed any longer. But that's because, again, the signs and symbols had served their purpose in telling them what was coming at the appointed time, Moad, namely the person of Jesus Christ, their Messiah. Now, 
Though the signs are of no use to us, it doesn't mean that they are of no value in what they mean to us. In other words, let me say the same thing a different way. Uh, it is a shame on pastors who will not teach on the feasts and their prophetic significance for us. Because as we're going to see, as we study these seven feasts and with the last four, actually more, more prophetically, the last three of the seven feasts, we're going to see how they do apply to us how they paint for us a picture of Bible prophecy, how these feasts will paint for us a prophecy about a rapture that will take place before the seven-year tribulation. What? Listen, Pastor J.D., I know that you are you know, vehement and dogmatic about a pre-tribulation rapture. So it doesn't surprise me when you would make a statement as bold as that a pre-tribulation rapture is in the feasts. It is. You don't have to take my word for it. You can be a Berean and you can search the scriptures daily and see if what I'm going to show you tonight a little bit and Lord willing next Thursday isn't true. See, the first four feasts were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, and the last three will be fulfilled in the rapture, and the second coming, and the kingdom age, and the new heavens, and the new earth. And this is why I wanted us to spend uh, a little more time on these seven feasts. To not do this would be to rob you of what I believe God has for you, and has for me here in the pages of Holy Writ. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to end our study tonight this way, and then we're going to pick it up this way, Lord willing, uh, next Thursday. You won't want to miss this study next Thursday. I don't care if you got plans, cancel them. You can't miss this because <laughs> it's, it's about the rapture. <laughs> okay, here they are. If you want that visual picture, that visual snapshot of the completion of these seven feasts and their prophetic fulfillment in Jesus' first and subsequently second coming. Now, we just studied the Passover, uh, unleavened bread, and the first fruits with uh, the prophetic picture of the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection. Now, 50 days later, the Feast of Pentecost... This is a prophetic picture of the birth of the church, the church age, fulfilled after Jesus' uh, Jesus' ascension. Again, in his first coming. Now, after the church age, which is symbolized by the feast of Pentecost 50 or 5, what do we have? We have the feast of trumpets. Oh, trumpet. Oh, really? Okay. Now, please don't envision the trumpets that your kids would buy for band. Okay. The brass, you know. <laughs> I used to play the trumpet, the trombone, and then they made me play the tuba. I, I'm still bitter, but that's enough of my problems. Anyway, <laughs> that's not what it was. It was what they call a shofar. And if you've ever heard a shofar, this trumpet or shofar sound, it will give you chicken skin. It is majestic. And this Feast of Trumpets, which we're going to get into in all of its detail, will picture and point to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to whet your appetite just a little bit. Now you for sure won't miss this. And I think some of you maybe, uh, in all fairness, have already uh, heard this teaching. But uh, I think it's been a while since I, I taught on it, like a year or year and a half. So I, I think that it's time again. But understand 
that when your mid-trib friends, your pre-wrath rapture friends come to you and say to you, no, the trumpets for Israel. And they say it just like that. You just want to just, you know. <laughs> you know not what you're talking about. <laughs> Get thee behind me. What is the matter with you? No, don't respond like that. I, I'll respond like that, but you don't respond like that. <laughs> you have to understand that there were two trumpets. There was the trumpet of God and the trumpet of angels. There was the trumpet for Israel and the trumpet for the church. And these two trumpets served two purposes. One purpose was to gather people together to come up to meet God. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but that's pretty clear to me. You know what the other uh, purpose of the trumpet was? To prepare God's people for battle. See, that trumpet for us is going to, and we're going to get into all of this, the difference between, the distinction between the two trumpets. One for Israel, preparing for battle, the tribulation. And one for us, preparing us to be brought up to meet God. And that's why the Feast of Trumpets is a picture of the rapture. What's the Day of Atonement? That's the second coming. If the rapture is not before, then you ruin the typology. This is when the whole house of Israel gets saved. Oh, by the way, by the way, I, I just, I, I can't wait till Sunday. You know what Sunday is? February 28th. It is the Feast of Purim. The Feast of what? Come on, man. <laughs> Listen, I, I just, I'm trying to get my mind around these seven. Don't, you know, confuse me with a, another one. Well, this wasn't one of the seven feasts, though. This was a celebration, a festival to this day celebrated by the Jews to commemorate and celebrate God delivering the Israelites out of the hands of one Haman. Book of Esther, Mordechai, Esther, Though I, if I perish, I perish. Oh, niece of mine, Uncle Mordechai would say, how do you know that you have not been raised up for such a time as this? And if you don't do this, then deliverance will come from another. Do you realize that Haman and King Arxuxes were Iranians, though not called that? They were Persians, not Arabs. Please, give the Arabs a break. Please, I'm begging you. Let my people go. <laughs> On this one anyway. <laughs> because the Persians are not Arabs. They don't speak Arabic. They speak Farsi. They are Persians. When did they become Iran? 1935. Interesting history with Iran. Now, here we find ourselves. It's not Haman. It's Ahmadinejad. He wants to annihilate. He wants to exterminate. He wants to eliminate. He wants to terminate. He wants to all the eight Israel and wipe them off the map so that they are a nation no more. Again, fulfilling uh, Bible prophecy. And that's what this Sunday is. It's a celebration of the Feast of Purim. Now, we're going to be talking about that uh, this Sunday. But what is so striking to me, whenever you study the feasts, you cannot divorce the history from the prophecy. It's been said again that the Old Testament reveals what the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. Uh, I just want to share one, one quick story. I know I'm going way off on a whole, uh, but that's okay. You, you still love me. You're such a gracious people. <laughs> I know that you, <laughs> you, the things you put up with with your pastor because he just, you know, anyway. But 
When I first got saved, I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation all the way through in six months. And I started in the book of Genesis. And I started uh, reading about, you know, the feasts, the animal sacrifices and everything. When I got to Leviticus, I mean, you, you wanted to see one confused new believer. I was going, huh? What? The Feast of Unleavened, What? Why? That, this has no application. To, this means nothing. I didn't know, you know, nowadays we say, hey, start in the Gospel of John. And that's okay. But I will say, when I got to the New Testament, oh my goodness. Because I had read the Old Testament, the New Testament leaped off the pages of my Bible and became real. All of it. See, funny story. I... I actually thought, I was a blank slate when I came to Christ. I had no clue. I mean, I just, you know, I was a new, I was on fire for the Lord. Here's how I would present the gospel. Jesus is real. He's really, really real. Jesus, and you need Jesus because he's real. That was how, that was all about, that was my entire theology. My entire theology was Jesus is real. Why? Because he was, became, he had become real in my life. That was it. And you know what? People got saved. I couldn't believe it. You know, I think after you get, you know, seasoned in the Lord, become, you know, spiritually mature and, you know, very dignified. And all of a sudden now the gospel's a little bit more, well, complicated. <laughs> And then we, we forget about the childlike innocence of the gospel. <laughs> Jesus, have you ever, have you ever heard a, a child present Jesus Christ as the Savior? You know, Jesus loves me, this I know for the... Oh, the other day I was taking Sabine. I know I'm completely off here and this has, I'm sure, some application. But just bear with me, we're almost done. I'm taking my uh, daughter on a bike ride. I have one of those front bike seats, you know. Someone uh, told me that they saw me one day and thought that I had Sabia on the handlebars. <laughs> Are they kidding me? <laughs> so anyway, I've got her strapped into this, you know, bike seat. And we're, we're riding the bike uh, to uh, Kailua Beach and singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And she's got the cutest voice. And she's saying, and I just, you know, I'm just her backup, you know. I'm just kind of like, ooh, you know. Sing it, girl. And we, we ride by these Japanese tourists. And they're looking and they're taking their cameras out and they're taking feet. They have never seen anything like this. I'm telling you, they're paparazzi. They're all over the place. <laughs> but the simplicity of it, the simplicity. I mean, anyway, I, I was so simple in my understanding and that was okay. But when I got to the New Testament, oh my goodness, it was just, it was like going from a black and white, you know those old TVs, I know you young people have no clue. We had like three channels. And forget remote controls, they hadn't come out with those yet. You wanted to change a channel, you had to get up, out of that chair, walk over to the TV, and then you get your three channels. And that was it. That was your TV. Anyway. That was black and white. Well, when you get to the New Testament, after reading the Old Testament, it's like going to color on an IMAX screen in 3D. That's what it was like for me because now all of a sudden when I'm reading about Jesus as the Lamb of God, I'm going, perfect! Here I'm thinking you've got to sacrifice lambs. I was so simple in my understanding. I'm thinking, you mean when I go to church, I got to find a lamb? and take it into church and, and slay it and shed its blood for, the, for my sins. Man, I don't want to do that. That poor lamb. But I hadn't, see, I didn't step foot in a church until, you know, until I'd read the Bible and it was six months before I'd stepped foot in a church. It was when somebody invited me. A friend of mine said, hey, uh, there's a new church that just started here in Spokane. It's called Calvary Chapel. And I walk into this church and here's one guy, one worship leader, like Leitu, it's in the summer, he's got sandals on and long hair and he's playing a song and I'm going, I'm home. And I never left. And that was 28 years ago. Why? Because it was childlike, simple. 
And I didn't step foot in the church until I had read the Bible. And then when I did go to church and I realized, wait a minute, we don't have to bring lamps. I mean, I can't remember pulling or driving by a church parking lot and seeing, you know, <laughs> you know the trucks, you know, come on, get, get them out. Joe, we need a, <laughs> is, it, is it without blemish? Get it over here. Come on, we got to get this show on the road. We're running late for second service. I don't remember that ever taking place. And, and then when I get to the New Testament, I read about how Jesus was the Lamb of God. And we don't need that anymore and it just all clicked and it was just amazing to me the last one the seventh one is the feast of tabernacles or the feast of booths and this is the kingdom age the millennium and eternity future the new heavens and the new earth and there you have the seven feasts of Israel I can't wait till next week uh, I pray that you'll read ahead uh, stay ahead. And let me take a step further. Will you, between now and next week, just ask the Lord to really prepare your heart for this study? Because I, I really have, I've really petitioned the throne uh, for this study, asking the Lord, please God, this is such a great study. And, you know, we may not get to the feast again for, you know, some time. And I just don't want us to miss this because it's so rich in its meaning to us. Why don't you all stand? <sighs> Father, how can we possibly thank you enough for your word and, and for this study that we have here tonight? Lord, thank you for the feasts. Thank you for their meaning to us. <laughs> Lord, it's just it's just awesome. I can't think of another word for lack of a better word. All I can think of is just, you are so awesome. I mean, we look at these feasts and how can we not just stand amazed and in awe of you? That you would do this for them then and for us now so that we could see you. Lord, thank you. Lord, will you now take this that we've read, seen, and heard tonight in your word? And now, by the Holy Spirit, will you bless it to our hearts and the application of it to our lives, that it will become real in our lives? Please don't allow us to just leave this here because I believe that you have really spoken to us here in a very powerful way. So Lord, thank you. We can't thank you enough. Lord, we're going to break bread tonight as we always do. We just want to ask for your blessing on the food, for your blessing on the fellowship. Lord, we want you to be glorified in all that we do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.